Daniel Meyer, Music Director of the Erie Philharmonic, and this is another edition of Coffee Chat. We've had a lot of fun getting a chance to know and get to, frankly, learn about the lives of our Philharmonic musicians. It's been a lot of fun for me, and I'm really pleased to have two members of our wonderful woodwind section with us on this chat. Of course, we've, yes, <laughs> we've got Heather Story, who's second oboe of the Philharmonic, and we've got Sarah Lee, who's also uh, second bassoon of the Philharmonic, and um, both wonderful woodwind players and, and uh, really fun people to get to know. First of all, welcome to you both. Uh, it's, it's, been, it's so good to see you, and I miss you both very much on stage. Oh, Thank great you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Sorry, this Sarah. is an opportunity for us to get to know folks a little bit uh, better. And of course, you two share something in common besides playing wind instruments. It's that you are relatively new parents. Tell us on uh, what is going on in your lives right now. Maybe tell us a little bit about your families. Um, and uh, when we uh, I can't wait to see them in Erie when it's uh, safe to get everybody reunited. Heather, why don't we start with you? Okay. Um, well, I have twin, identical twin boys um, who just turned one last month um and it's just been a joy harold and clive and they they are a real treat they look very similar um but their personalities are pretty opposite um but it's been a really fun, i'm a big nerd so for me they're a lot of experimentation <laughs> hopefully not in a weird way but uh just seeing how much dna does and doesn't contribute to who we are because you know theirs is exactly the same but um, just the way it manifests in their life and their personality is really different. So that's been really fun for us. Oh, wonderful. And how about you, Sarah? Yeah, um, I have a sweet little baby girl. Her name is Winter Ann, and we call her Winnie. Um, she is about seven and a half months now. Um, so she was born January 2nd. She was the first baby. I live in Janesville, Wisconsin, and she was the first baby in Janesville. She was actually the first baby in the state of Wisconsin outside of Milwaukee, which is really fun. Um, her due date was actually the first, so we were like so, so close on that. Um, and she got to be on the front page of the newspaper, and um, it was it was a really, really fun, really sweet. Um, and I had the, and actually both Heather and I have the unique experience of, I played two concerts in the fall, um, very pregnant, <laughs> as, as did Heather. So I, you know, I did two symphonic concerts in the fall. And I remember thinking there was one in November and I was so glad it was not the end of November um, because it was so close to the due date. And I was just thinking, how am I going to play bassoon with like, you know, like logistically, and uh, I don't know how this seems like gonna fit. Um, but so she actually got a, those were her first two concerts, which was kind of fun um, to think about. So, yeah. Did you have to relearn your technique to make that happen? I mean, did you, did you literally have to hold a bassoon in a different orientation? Um, well, so the, the, not sort of, an, not really, but maybe like a little bit. <laughs> um, I had to like move the seat strap forward. So the instrument just like that a little bit farther away. Um, but it wasn't as bad as I thought. The really lovely thing, um, both, and that's, that's kind of unique actually to the Erie Phil, um, is that the bassoon section is female. <laughs> there are a lot of female bassoonists out there. Um, and so there are more now, but uh, there aren't a, a whole lot of them. Um, and Heather and I are actually both really lucky that um, her principal, you know, Dana is is female and is a mom too. Um, and so I, I was talking, you know, I had lots of conversation with Laura, like, how do I play? Like you were pregnant. She's she remembered being in New York City, you know, schlepping around really pregnant with her bassoon on the subway and just like, oh, you can do it though. And so I think that was, it was a really uh, unique and um, wonderful experience to be able to share that with her. And she could see, you know, she could see Winnie kicking, um, you know, during certain parts of the, of the music. And yeah, so that's a really unique, a unique, unique thing to be very filled to have, to have that support. Heather, how about you? I mean, is do you did you experience any um, difficulty breathing or getting you know kind of the amount of air that you needed in order to play the instrument, or what what sorts of adjustments do you have to make when you're when you're pregnant and playing a woodwind instrument? Yeah, thankfully for me, it stayed largely the same. Um, I had just really um, easy pregnancy. It had all sorts of uh, potentials to go awry at many different points and it just never did. 
Um, so I really didn't experience a lot of sickness. Sorry, Sarah. Um, Sarah was really <laughs> sick most of the time, like all the time. And I, I didn't have to experience that too much. And my body actually handled it really easily. So uh, I think my capacity to hold out longer phrases towards the end of the pregnancy did get shorter and shorter. I had to work in more breaths for sure. Um, but it's it wasn't unmanageable. Um, and thankfully, while I played, the boys tend to tended to stay pretty still, which I was very grateful for. Um, I don't know if they could like really feel, you know, my diaphragm at work or if that affected them very much, but they would always move around when the strings played. Uh, that was really what they got into was the strings and uh, the brass and the, the percussion didn't seem to affect them very much or the woodwinds, but they really loved the strings or they hated it. I, it could have been a protest too. I'm not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, how does your how does your daughter react to you? Have you had a chance to play in the same room with her? I mean, does she is she quiet? Does she listen? Does she just go nuts? I mean, what's what's her reaction? Oh, Heather and I have laughed about this. I should say that this is maybe a fun fact. Uh, Heather and I are best friends. Um, we were actually best friends before she she won the job first, and then I came later. Um, we were actually in each other's weddings um, before I either. I was even playing. She was playing in, in the area full first and we were in each other's weddings and we did, a, we met an undergrad at Ball State. Um, so we talk a lot every day. <laughs> and uh, I talked a lot about this. I had this dream um, <laughs> of playing bassoon and having it be this like very like wonderful experience for my daughter and she'd be fussing and then I'd play and she'd, she'd like fall <laughs> Yeah, so that's like, Completely not the case. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, is I wonder to some degree if she is, if it's such a familiar sound to her that it's, it's like, it's nothing new. Um, so she just, you know, she's just like, oh, that's happening because that always happens. And she just goes on with her day. And she's like, but why aren't you giving me attention? <laughs> I think that's probably it. It's probably, she sees a, a competitor for your attention. And, yeah, and well, I'm actually in, well, this was my bassoon room. And then my husband's office became the nursery. So now it is our office that we share. You can see his like stuff over there. Um, and then we had a baby. And so now if it's not too bumpy, you can see uh, that is our, I, I usually can get like 20 minutes of practice with her rolling around on the floor behind me. So that's pretty good. I am, that is really big. That's the seventh month we're like, you know. Um, so yeah, that, that's the long answer to that. <laughs> Heather, is that the same with you? I mean, are you able to, are the boys able to kind of hang out while you're playing or is it just like complete bedlam? Uh, I mean, it is bedlam, but we have, I think you could see it a little bit over the corner. We have this like fenced area. So we've fenced off a section of the house that's kind of theirs and they stay there. Um, and they, we kind of try to capture the bedlam a little bit. Uh, when I have played with them awake and around, um, they just kind of don't seem to care. It does not matter to them. Like they carry on playing. Um, but usually when I play or when I work on reads, I do it when they're napping or when they're asleep. Um, because, you know, especially with read stuff, that's just like too tempting for them to either destroy the product or to end the, the labor of my hands. Um, or for them to hurt themselves just with the knives and things or, you know, like tiny pieces for them to stick in their mouth. Um, so usually I do a lot of stuff at, at night or when they're napping. Yeah, I mean, that kit has some pretty sharp elements in it, right? I mean, that's definitely something you don't want to have anywhere near, near yeah. kids. Um, explain that a little bit. I know we talked a little bit about this um, in a, a previous chat, but um, you really spend, you know, of the time that you spend devoted to your instrument, a significant portion, but it is not even actually playing it. It's it's getting it prepared to play, right, Heather? I mean, how much time would you say it has to go into just preparing a, a single read to get ready for a, a performance or a, or a recital? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I'm really bad and poorly disciplined at doing it, but um, <laughs> the more you do it, the faster you get, for sure, and you learn uh, quickly when reads are viable and when they aren't you kind of learn like oh i just can't 
I can't rescue this read and you just move on. Um, but it does, I mean, I know Laura talked about uh, the like several day process to week process of getting bassoon reads like to a really functional point. And I think oboe reads are very similar um, and we have to work on them in kind of sections of time. You can't work on them for too long or you really compromise the integrity of the cane. Um, you also, your hands get tired and your eyes get tired. So you have to do it in chunks. Uh, so it takes me several days to get a read from like initial like piece of cane and um, tube to the point of being playable uh, just because you work on it probably in, in 20 to 40 minute spurts uh, mm -hmm. on each read. Um, and so it, you know, first you have to wrap it and then you have to let it rest and then it rests for a day and then you scrape it down and then it rests for a day because each time you let it rest, kind of the fibers reform and it like strengthens a little bit more. It's almost like trying to fit it into a mold and it has to kind of settle in and then you can work on it again and then give it a chance to settle in. And it just creates a read that lasts just a little bit longer and that is a little bit more predictable. Um, when you do it over that longer span of time. Sarah, how do you, I assume you do yours in steps as well. I mean, how do you keep that organized? Do you have like a fish tackle box or uh, <laughs> I mean, how do you, how do you look at a reason? Oh no, I'm not supposed to be scraping that way. Yeah. Um, well, life has changed a lot since having a baby. I was, it was a little bit different before. I have like a drawer that I could like, you can kind of see it has like, they're all like oh, yeah. sliding down. I have like, so I have them in different stages like that. It's mostly empty right now because um, as uh, Heather said, I was really sick in my pregnancy um, and was, I mean, just just like hardly was able to practice and make reads. Um, but I also have like different, you know, different stages of stuff going on here. I finally was like, I have to start making reads again. So like, um, Heather said there are different there are different um there are things for bassoon reads that Laura talked about this have to be done on different days they have to like dry out completely and then you come back so I I had made up quite a few reads um you know probably during the time in that I was in Erie and they have become very depleted <laughs> so this is something I need to focus on again but just started again making like blanks this is what it it looks like as a blank and then you wrap it and put the wire on and clip the top off and it's somewhat similar for oboe um but um let's you know say of, let's say out of 10 reads that you make as blanks um can you expect 10 out of 10 to be playable or do you just know that that some of them are just going to be duds um you know, it's so hard. I know that's such a difficult question to, to answer. Sometimes like eight out of 10 will be pretty good. And then sometimes like one or two out of 10 will be good. Wow. And you never know if it's like the best. That's why it's such a difficult question to answer. Um, you know, it, there are just so many factors. And then sometimes reads are really good at the beginning and then aren't good. And then sometimes they aren't good and then they become good. And, um, you know, sometimes reads take a long time to break in and and then sometimes a read is really good for something and then it isn't good for another concert because our concerts are so different. Um, I think something that's really important every day is, is to wake up and just see how my reads are that day. Um, and, you know, I have like a couple boxes where they're like, I rank them in my mind, um, you know, to good and bad. And th that shifts because the weather changes every day, the humidity changes every day, often where I am, Physically, if I'm in a different state, is different. The concerts are different. You know, it's just like, um, yeah, it's, it's challenging. Sometimes I'm like, why did I pick this instrument? And I really love it. So, you know, it is what it is. It strikes me that you would have to be rather emotionally together <laughs> yeah. to deal with the, just the, 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 the nature of, of the beast in terms of it not being predictable and, and you know, you really thinking, oh, you've got something amazing here that you're excited about playing on. And then you realize that it's just not going to work out and, and, and vice versa. Right. I've, I've really found that the reads tend to be the best if the weather is the same when I play it as it was when I made it. So if it was rainy when I wrapped my read and like did the initial scrape on it, then it will usually play the best on a rainy day. If it's 
sunny and low humidity, then it just really doesn't like it. So then I have to pay attention. And sometimes even Erie and Cleveland are really close to each other, but every once in a while, the weather is totally different between Cleveland and Erie. And so it'll be like, oh, well, which I don't know. This actually worked great in Cleveland, but in Erie, it's protesting. So um, yeah, it's just a whole, it's so funny to have so much of your like sound identity hang on this seemingly animate like object where you're like, you know, you don't get to, but I remember hearing stories of, of John Mack saying, you know, never accept no from an inanimate object. So it was just always about like disciplining the read and you tell it what it's going to do and don't accept no from an inanimate object. So I am in control. I am in control of it. <laughs> Sometimes it's a real mantra I have to repeat where it's like, no, I, I know what I'm doing. I know how to do this. So, yeah. <laughs> Finicky to say the least, um, which is kind of mind blowing that that whole extra layer is added on to the fact that you just have to master your instrument and work on your technique and your embouchure and your breath support and your musicianship and your phrasing and, and all the other things that go along with being a good musician. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, your beginnings as a musician. Did you both start out on the oboe or, or, or was there another gateway instrument that then led you to the oboe? I, I actually remember um, as a violinist um, being recommended to, to, to study oboe. Um, and I thought, what? that's interesting. I never even thought about that, but um, I, maybe he, he just needed some good oboe players in the orchestra <laughs> at that point and thought that I might be able to do it. But um, I didn't actually take through on the advice, but I mean, uh, how did you guys get started on your instruments? Did you admire somebody who played an oboe or um, just kind of happen upon it by accident? Sarah, why don't we start with you? Oh, yeah. Um, well, you could have also played bassoon, Daniel. I'd like to point that out, but um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, uh, so I actually, my family's pretty musical. My uh, parents are both uh, music teachers. Uh, my mom is an elementary music, was an elementary music teacher for, I don't know, 30 something years. And my dad also just retired um, and taught music education band in tuba at a university. So um, we started, I mean, you know, I think my mom was singing to us in the womb. <laughs> and then we, uh, um, I started actual piano lessons at five and violin at seven. Um, and then, you know, we took voice lessons. And I think, well, as my dad always says, he didn't want to pay for college. And so <laughs> <laughs> he had said, I think you're a bassoonist. And so I ended up trying it. And at the university where he taught, there was a, a really wonderful bassoon teacher that I was lucky to get to study with. Um, Kim Whittemore is her name in Wichita. And, um, you know, that's not always true. As Heather can say, it's the luck of the draw if you're in a you know, a smaller town. I was in Wichita, Kansas. So, which, you know, it's like 300,000 people, but um you don't know what access you might have to, to a really good teacher on those kind of like, you know, fringe instruments. Um, and so I was really lucky to have somebody like her build foundations for me. Um, yeah, so I started bassoon then at 14. Bassoon is a unique instrument because your body has to be big enough to play it. They don't make smaller ones. <laughs> um, and so really you can't you really can't start until your your body is big enough to be able to to hold it and play it and your you know even now my hands don't always reach i have to have some adjustments made um because my hands are kind of small so um yeah so i actually came from violin which is super unusual most people who play bassoon come from like saxophone or clarinet um, but because of my unique situation i was able to the summer before eighth grade i took lessons before i started in the local band program um, so yeah, that's kind of my meandering way. And I definitely, uh, sort of just did it for whatever. And I didn't even start college. I started as a language major, um, didn't even start as a music major. Um, but you know, they still paid me to play bassoon in the band. So, <laughs> so they were right. My dad was, don't tell him I said this <laughs> <He was right laughs> about, about not paying for college because they needed a bassoonist. So almost um, let the babies grow up to be fringe instrument players. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Although now he'll say, it, he, I think when, when I got married, he told my husband, well, now it's your expensive bassoon habit. So <laughs> the instruments and the reeds and the, the time and everything, it's, you know, it's definitely a labor of love, but that's sort of how I came to it. And, you know, it's 
always been an important, music has always been an important part of my life. Um, so bassoon just really was a natural fit. And I've always loved the sound and, um, you know, the, the unusualness of it. Um, so, yeah. How about you, Heather? Um, well, both of my parents really like music, uh, but, and they were both teachers, but not of music. Uh, so I come from a very musically appreciative household, uh, but not necessarily a musical household. My dad has a very good ear, um, and he played drums and percussion when he was in high school. Um, my mom used to play accordion, uh, and my grandmother loves to sing. My grandfather was in a barbershop quartet. So there is a lot of music, kind of amateur music in my um, in my family on both sides, largely my dad's side. Um, and my parents did not have a lot of rules for me as I grew up. But when I was entering middle school, the one rule my dad had with it was that I was going to be in the band. It was, you will be in the band. You choose which instrument you want, but you will be in the band. There are no other options. Um, and we had a, an exchange student from Mexico who played flute. And she was like the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. And she bought this beautiful glass flute while she lived with us. And I just thought, I'm going to play the flute because if I play the flute, I'll be beautiful like her, um, which is the way you think when you're in like fifth grade. Um, and so when I entered middle school in sixth grade, I started playing flute. And by the end of the first semester, I had learned like the entire book that was supposed to last us through the whole year. I had already gone through the whole thing and I was teaching myself vibrato and, and all this other stuff. But I loved doing it. I just loved practicing. So I just kept practicing, but by the end of the semester, I was really bored um, in band. And we had two bands in my uh, middle school. One of them had an oboe and the other one didn't. I was in the one without an oboe. So when we had our first kind of combined band concert, I heard this, you know, other sixth grade oboe player that I had never heard before. I had no idea what this instrument was. Um, and I like to say that like a dove descended from heaven and translated what the oboe could be <laughs> from what the sound of a sixth grade oboe actually is. And I said, oh, well, that's louder. I wanna play that. Like, can I play the louder one? Um, and one of my band directors was an oboist. So he of course was thrilled that somebody, wanted, somebody else wanted to play his instrument. My dad thought I said I wanted to play bassoon. He thought the bassoon and the oboe were the same thing, which is a very common, um, a very common thought. And He's told me that story a bunch. There. Yes, he <laughs> really was so excited for me to play the oboe, which he thought was a bassoon. Um, so when I brought the oboe home, he was like, that's, that's not an oboe. I'm like, no, oh, dad, it really is. Like, this is really what it is. He's like, are you sure you want to play that? I was like, yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> and um, both my band directors and my parents kept telling me over and over again how challenging an instrument it is. Oh, it's so hard. It's not like the flute. It's so hard. Are you sure you want to do it? And I was like, I always like hard things. Like, yes, I want to do it. Um, and I have a personality where the more you tell me I can't do something, the more determined I am to do it. So um, I just, yeah, halfway through my sixth grade year, I started playing the oboe and, and caught on pretty quickly uh was able to make some you know not quite offensive sounds from you know the early days and had a great time um and i remember uh later on that year somewhere around ball state's campus because i grew up in muncie indiana uh, they had posted the salaries of all the major orchestras in the states and i was like what you could get paid to play? Like, this is a thing that people do. I could get paid to basically go to band practice all day long. <laughs> and I loved it. And so that was the point at which I was like, well, I'm gonna be, a, I'm gonna be an instrumentalist. Like, I'm gonna be a professional musician. And that's, that's what it is. My dad thought, oh, wow, I guess people actually do this when he saw some of the figures come out. Of course, they're like the New York Phil and Boston and Cleveland and LA. And he's like, oh, people make good money doing this. Um, and uh, I remember my dad was picking up reeds from one of the music stores and the salesman said, oh, your daughter plays oboe? Well, 
even mediocre oboists get jobs. And, uh, and he was like, all right, <laughs> that's great. She made the right choice. Uh, so I guess uh, we had some very strange standards in my family for what was considered a viable career, um, both very low and very high. Uh, just thinking, well, even if you're mediocre, you can make something out of it. But of course, you'll be at the level of the Cleveland Orchestra or LA, right? This is what you'll really be making. Uh, and we kind of landed somewhere in the middle, <laughs> which is fine. Um, I love it still. Um, but I love it because I love being part, like one part of the bigger whole. So practicing is very hard for me because I hate playing by myself. That's not the point. For me, that's not why I play the instrument. I play the instrument to be a part of the conversation with all the other musicians um, and to be one piece of this beautiful, like aural puzzle or this wonderful painting. So when I practice, I understand that there's a purpose for practicing and it is for the benefit of myself and my colleagues. And that's why I practice, but man, it's just really not fulfilling to practice, especially orchestral parts. When you're just like, oh, now I'll play a phrase for four bars and now I'll rest for 20 more bars and now I'll play another 16 bar phrase. And um, yeah, so COVID's been hard for that reason, for sure. Yes. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, we talked about that at the very beginning. It's just, you know, being in the rhythm of preparing for concerts is something that truly motivates us as musicians. I mean, it really, it, ins it, it kind of it reinforces the discipline that we've kind of learned to deal with since we were really young in that, of course, you have to keep practicing to stay on top of your instrument, but you also have the pressure of, hey, I'm going to have to play this part by myself in this tapestry, as you say, as this in this painting or in this beautiful piece of art, and everybody else is going to be depending on me to, to, to come through. Uh, with my my part of the whole. Um, so I think there's that additional pressure that is a, in, in many ways a positive thing and helps keep us kind of in the routine and the rhythm of, of what it takes to, to play in a professional orchestra like the Erie Philharmonic. Um, I wanted to ask you both, if you were to introduce or if you were to hold a gold standard and you say, now go and check this person's playing out because he or she is the most beautiful um, exponent of the instrument that I've ever come across. Who would you recommend? What kind of recordings? Um, you know, if somebody was interested in, in doing a slightly deeper dive on the oboe, Heather, who would you recommend as your top top players? Um, well, I mean, John Mack is just, he just has in a sound that makes your heart melt. Um, and his phrasing is, and his musicality is so gorgeous. Um, and he was principal of the Cleveland Orchestra for years and years. Um, but their, their principal now, uh, Frank Rosenwein, also has a gorgeous sound, um, also as part of that lineage. Um, and he's living and incredibly kind and has twin boys. So, you know, we are basically <laughs> the same person. Uh, that's not true at all. <laughs> he's like in a whole other league for me, but I feel a kinship with him. Um, <laughs> But I think uh, the Cleveland recordings are just gorgeous. But my absolute favorite is uh, someone that I don't think gets talked about a whole lot. Um, and he was my professor in undergrad at the North Carolina School of the Arts. Um, his name was John Ellis. He's since passed, which is heartbreaking. But he uh, used to play with the Hollywood Bowl orchestra and he did it was John's number one call for any of his um, scores and he did countless um, movie soundtracks he's really known for stepmom um, if you know that film at all um, but there's a huge oboe solo in stepmom and that's really what he's known for he also recorded Close Encounters of the Third Kind um, the the like famous the main theme. tune the da, main da, theme. Da, da, da. that's yep. him that's oh, wow. him um and at one point it is played both with two oboes and an english horn and he actually played all three parts oh, um, wow. they yeah. tried to do it recording they tried to do it with three different musicians and they just couldn't get it to match the way they wanted it to so he told us this great story it was in the er like earlier days of tracking um so he recorded the principal part and then they played that back to him in one ear and he recorded the second part. And then they played principal in one ear, second in the other ear and he recorded the English horn part um, all himself because he can, you know, you blend with yourself the best. So uh, he recorded all three of those parts at, at wow. one point in the score. Um, but I love his playing 
to me, it is like, it just ceases to be an oboe. It's like not this extra, I don't know, like extension of the body. It like is a person. It is a voice. I just absolutely love everything about his sound. And when he plays to me, he's one of the most unique oboe sounds. I always know it's him whenever I hear a recording and I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's my teacher. And they'll say, well, that was the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra. And I'm like, yay. <laughs> um, I just think he has the most gorgeous sound. I wish everybody um, was as familiar with his work. Um, I mean, I think they're more familiar than they realize. Uh, they don't necessarily know that they've probably heard his scores, but um, he also did Memoirs of a Geisha. Uh, that was also him. So those are in now, here's an excuse to go watch some classic cinema as well. Um, but I really love him. John Ellis. John Ellis me. and John Mack, two Johns. Yeah, the Johns. <laughs> the Johns. <laughs> How about you, Sarah? Do you have any, um, some models or, or some players that you really admire and, and that um, you could point us to, to to listen for kind of the best bassoon playing? Uh, um, well, I grew up listening to Klaus Tuneman is a really famous bassoonist um yeah Heather's nodding he's everybody's heard of him he's a he's a pretty pretty famous guy and has a very um I mean just is one of the best period and has recorded just gold standards on a lot of the the most common bassoon repertoire um has a beautiful sound um he's German just just a phenomenal player um and he's older now so a lot of his really great recordings came from probably like the 90s and um, early 2000s. But growing up, you know, that was what I got to hear a lot of um, and what my teacher exposed me to. Um, one of my favorite orchestral sounds, uh, David McGill was the principal of Chicago during a really formative period um, during like high school to probably my early time in college. And then, um, yeah, probably up through like 20, he retired 20, 2012, um, something like that. Um, I actually, with a friend, drove like overnight to hear him play um, a concerto with the, with the Chicago Symphony when we were living in Muncie, Indiana, when, when uh, Heather and I were in school together. Um, we drove overnight. Well, we saw it and then had to drive back for class like the next day. <laughs> um, you know, in terms of, he just was the best. Um, he just had just phenomenal, uh, the bassoon is so technically challenging. Um, and, you know, I think we all are trying to practice so that we can make music with the instrument, you know, so technique can be out of the way so we can just make music. Um, and he studied a lot of, um, Heather mentioned this like singing. Um, he studied a lot of opera uh, and tried to implement those things that happen so naturally when you sing onto the instrument. I think you hold the instrument and it kind of can get in the way sometimes. And okay. so he um, he had a lot of famous singers that he would follow to, to really um, influence his sound. Um, and Heather, I'm glad you said something about your teacher. Uh, Mr. Winston was my teacher at, at in Cincinnati at CCM. Um, you know, we love their sound because we chose to study with them because we wanted to sound like them. Um, which is why we, I was just thinking, Oh yeah, I love his sound more than anything. And I was like, of course I do. He's like, you know, he's like my father on, on the instrument. Um, and he, mm, and he actually just really recently passed away, um, in January of this year, uh, which was really challenging. Um, but yeah, it was like, it was like losing a, a parent. When, when he passed away, um, he uh, has a unique sound and it may not be for everybody. Um, he, you'll, you'll, you'll always know he's there. He's very loud. <laughs> um, but so, I mean, just like, where's his heart? Like his heart is dripping in everything he plays. Um, and that's the way he lived his life as well. <laughs> um, and so I, I just, um, just loved him and loved his playing um, and loved how he sounded in the orchestra. I got, I got to go and I know you got to hear this too a lot, Heather. I got to hear him play, you know, almost every week in the orchestra for however many, four years I was in Cincinnati. Um, and so, yeah, what it, I look at that now and I'm like, my gosh, what a gift that was. And I also was able to, 
um, you know, I hear now recordings like on NPR or something and I'm like, oh, that sounded like Winstead. <laughs> and then I'll hear and it's like, oh, that was the Cincinnati Pops. And I was like, oh, he felt a certain way about that solo and you can hear it in the way he played it. <laughs> he had a big personality for sure, so. I love yeah. that though, because, you know, you know, the casual listener will probably not even be able to pick out a, the, the bassoon line or, or necessarily the, the oboe line in a recording. Yeah. You guys, are, you're so attuned to the colors that these players make and the way that they phrase and the way that they intend to play these particular parts. Um, I think it's a lot of fun. And, and, and frankly, I just think it, it's, it's fun. The more that you get used to listening and unpacking a piece of classical music, first of all, you realize how densely orchestrated these pieces are and that you really can listen 15 times and still find something that you never even noticed was there. Um, but then also to attune your ears to the specific color of, of your instruments, um, I think is also a, a lot of fun. And it, um, and it, and it just kind of drives home the fact that, that these are such personal expressions, you know, as much as you've got these, this, this beast, this, this instrument that you have to tame somehow and make work, whether it's contending with a reed that's not, not complying or, or these keys, these metal keys on a, on a wooden cylinder, you know, and, and trying to make this thing kind of come to life. Ultimately, the best artists are the ones that can transcend the, the technique and really project their personality and their, their, their souls into the music. And I, I, I just love what both of you said about um, just kind of being able to, to pick out someone's sound because they have such an unmistakable way about playing the orchestra and realizing their intentions through their particular instrument. Um, and that's, I think that's what's just so fun and so gratifying with working with artists like you two, because you know, the orchestra is this wonderful amalgamation of all these personalities. And for some reason, we all buy into this idea that we need to get to get along for, for four rehearsals, you know, three rehearsals, four rehearsals in a concert. Um, but we do it because we love the music so much, but we also understand that there's a joy to, to the ex experiencing these different colors coming at us um, simultaneously. And it's just fun to think about how we can isolate those individual sounds. Um, so I encourage anybody who, who, um, who likes to, you know, listen to recordings or, or dabble in, in different uh, performances of, say, Rimsky, Korsakoff, Scheherazade, or La Mer, or some other great big uh, woodwind piece, um, to listen to those colors specifically and really isolate what these composers do, because they were attuned to these ideas too, that there really is an ability to to isolate instrument color, isolate emotion, and bring forth different, uh, evoke different ideas in the music through the colors that you select. And and frankly, the ranges, you know, and, and what I love both about oboe and bassoon is that there's such, I mean, I know you probably both strive for a unanimity of, of, among the, the ranges of the instrument, but there really is a different color from, you know, a very low oboe versus the, you know, the, the medium range and the high, and, and same with the bassoon in terms of the way that it can penetrate the way that it can sing and soar. Um, what would you say is the, the, the number one thing that, um, that young musicians in particular working with your instruments have to contend with uh, to kind of wrestle with their instruments? What, what, what would be the biggest kind of issue um, for, a, for a young oboe player when they're first getting going on the instrument? Uh, I think the hardest thing, certainly the hardest thing for me, um, and I think it is for most young oboists is how to to make your embouchure, just the embouchure in general, um, to make it like a happy environment for the reed to exist. I struggled in my earliest days, and even I still struggle with this now. Um, I really want to clamp down um, and like control the reed, but this is where like reed making technique and mastery is so important because um, your mouth really needs to be like a warm, happy environment that allows the best vibrations of your reed to exist. Um, you don't want to always be fighting your reed. And um, so I think that combination of having a good reed and having an embouchure that works well together with the reed, that's the hardest thing. Even as a professional, that's the hardest thing. Um, but like figuring out how to form this like how to make your mouth do this thing you need to do, but with, but control it, but not too controlled, um, if that makes sense. I also know that a lot of young oboists um, struggle with headaches as well, just the intense pressure that builds up inside your, your head and your nasal cavities um, is, can be, it affects everybody a little bit differently. 
Um, and I do know a few people who really wanted to play the oboe and just never could get over the headaches that it would cause. Um, and honestly, I don't do a lot of teaching. In fact, I don't do any teaching at all, um, which may make my parents sad, but um, it's fine, it makes me happy. Um, but yeah, I just don't know how one overcomes that. Um, honestly, I don't. I, I would guess maybe going to an Alexander Technique uh, specialist or something to see if there are other places where you're holding tension that are exasperating the um, the tension that's inside your head, the pressure inside your head already. Um, but I know that that is a struggle, especially for young players um, in the early days. And some people work it out, work through it. Some people just can't, can't, it's not worth it to them. And I would say like, it's, it's different for every person um, for sure. But those are probably the two biggest. How about you, Sarah? Um, definitely uh, read an instrument, I would say. Um, the bassoon is an expensive instrument and even a, a student, a, a student model, I mean, you can get a really not great one, um, can, you know, be a couple thousand dollars. A really good student instrument is, you know, oh gosh, I don't even know what they run now, eight or nine thousand dollars. Um, and so I think you run into an issue where often, you know, band teachers are so busy and they don't have time to really teach good care of instrument or know how to do it well. Um, I got into a lot of high schools and, you know, just, you know, even for free, just said, hey, let me look at your instruments and I'll give you and, you know, then I can teach a couple of your students. But, you know, let me look at your instruments and see. And it's like, oh, my gosh, these instruments are like, I can't play them. Like they, some of them, they don't make sound in certain areas. Um, you know, the got students that are contending with instruments that you, even you can't can't make a good sound on. And, and but to think that they should be able to make any sound is kind of unfathomable. Yeah. And I'm like, well, yeah, of course, you know, little Bobby doesn't want to play the bassoon. This thing is, a, you know, I only have four letter, letter words to describe what this thing is. So I don't know. Like, and don't you understand? Like, you know, it's, it's, you know, the same, band teachers are, you know, they're continuing with a whole bunch of kids all with really expensive things. And I'm like, but the bassoon is worth like all of the clarinet and flute section combined. So like, please. Um, anyways. And so I think that is the hardest thing. It's like, how do you even play? And, um, then often they have reads that are just terrible. So, you know, I'll, I'll meet with a student for the first time and it's like, their read is like cracked right down the middle. And I'm like, oh, well, of course you can. Okay. You're going to feel really good in like 20 minutes when we do a couple of really easy things. Um, but, you know, it's also really challenging. They don't have a lot of money in the schools. And, you know, how do you say like, we need to buy a $5,000 bassoon, <laughs> you know, and they're like, well, here's your $50 budget for the year. So good luck. Um, and, you know, it's like, uh, it's an unfortunate uh, barrier to the instrument. It's true for all instruments, but the bassoon specifically that, you know, you have to, you have to have a family or some kind of way to access, you know, such an expensive instrument. So it's amazing what some of these kids can make work. That is all I have to say. <laughs> Out of sheer force of will. <laughs> I'm like, how are you, how have you stayed playing this for two years and not like, you know, just been like, I'm done. <laughs> I, mean, I think that's another big inhibitor because particularly with an instrument that's not like the piano where you press a key and okay it's going to be in tune or as in tune as the instrument is um, but when you can when you're first starting off at an instrument that has so many variables and and making a good sound being like the last thing that happens <laughs> that's got to be a love there has to be a level of frustration that comes with that I mean anybody who's listened to a junior string ensemble in the first couple of years. You just wonder how on earth do these kids stay with this instrument because the, the, the sound is just so difficult to listen to. It's so grating and it takes a while to really develop a technique good enough to, to make a decent tone and to play more or less in tune. Um, it's, it's, it's a small wonder. <laughs> Maybe that ever don't know. We're <laughs> 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 just having fun. <laughs> Well, I want to say that I, I've had a lot of fun um, talking to both of you. I, I mean, we, this could go for two hours, but I, um, we'll, we'll keep it within YouTube standards. <laughs> Can I grab Winnie really quickly? Yes, I would love, we would love to see her, yeah. Well, to see edit this part out. Oh, there she is. Oh, there she is. Oh, my goodness. Hi, okay, so she is in her specific 
Oh, that is hilarious. Irresistible. I'm irresistible. <laughs> <laughs> this was, uh, this is Curtis. This was a sweet gift from Lisa who works for the, um, who works for the org. Oh shoot. She just touched it. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's, that's all right. Okay. Still <laughs> <laughs> that's real life, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. She wasn't in the zoom call before, but oh my goodness. This is our, our youngest fan. And if you want to see Heather's boys are, Napping. So stinking cute and napping. And they are in a video. You you did a video of the, um, you did a short video. Oh, yeah, in the beginning well, that's of right. the yeah. pandemic. Yeah, gardening. That's right. And that resides on our website at eriefield.org. So if you're interested, uh, check yeah. it out. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me just say that I, I'm so grateful to both of you for giving up some of your time. I know you're both busy new parents and, and have a lot of things on your plate, but it's just really a great chance to get to get to talk to you and get to know you a little bit better. And um, like I say to everybody, I just, I really can't wait to be back with you on stage and making music and, and when we can all be together. Um, yeah, me too. Same. And hardly wait. Thank you. <laughs> so cheers to both. And thanks everybody for joining us on this edition of Coffee Chat. Um, Heather Story, second oboe and Sarah Lee, second bassoon of the year. Really? Get ready. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.